some of random graphs. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I will uh, uh, speak about uh, non-backtracking uh, works and uh, their spectrum. I hope uh, that at the end of the talk you will have found them uh, more interesting than at the beginning. So I will uh, try to explain you how you can use uh, non-backtracking works to uh, to, to deduce uh, sharp estimates of spectral gaps or norms of uh, uh, random matrices. Okay, so I'll start by the case of uh, the norm of sparse random matrices. So to take an example, uh, I took the, the simplest one. So I take uh, an Erdoshini graph and I look at the adjacency matrix. So I have uh, an array of uh, Bernoulli variables, they are IID, and uh, above the diagonal, and they are normalized so that uh, the, they are equal to one with probability d over n. So the d is an average degree of a vertex. It's the expectation of the sum of the uh, Bernoulli variables on each row. Okay, so the good way to think about the degree is not the L1 norm, but it's uh, the square of the L2 norm of the x of the row indexed by x, okay? Because it's just zero, one variables. Okay, so this matrix has uh, some is symmetric. It has some uh, eigenvalues, lambda one to lambda n. It has non, uh, it has, uh, it is, uh, it has non-negative entry. So lambda one is a Perron eigenvalue, and uh, all the other eigenval uh, eigenvalues are, I mean, all eigenvalues are interesting. So let's look at uh, what's happened on single realization. So if you take the average degree five, you see the Perron eigenvalue here, and some uh, most eigenvalues I st they tend to stick to some bulk, and when d is equal to 20, it's, uh, it looks much more like that, okay, where the Perron eigenvalue goes, st tend to, to be very far from the rest of the others. Okay, so the regime where I, which I will be interested in, the regime of uh, governed by random matrix theory. So when the degree is, goes to infinity, at the rate you want, as the size of the matrix goes to infinity, uh, it's quite easy to see that uh, the histogram of eigenvalues here converge to the semicircular law, okay, when you renormalize everything by square root d. Okay, so if you count the number of eigenvalues which are larger than t times square root d in proportion, the proportion converge to the mass of the semicircular law on this interval. Okay? So the only consequence for what uh, we are interested in is that the if you take any, the case largest eigenvalue, it is at least two square root of d times something up to a vanishing factor, okay? Okay, so what is known about uh, eigenvalues of uh, adjacency matrix of random graph, of the other Schwinni graph? Uh, so the, 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 the fate of the largest eigenvalue has been uh, settled down by Krivlevich and Sudakov. They have proved that the large, they have the, the exact asymptotic equivalent for the, uh, the largest eigenvalue. So D is like uh, the average degree or the square root of the max of the average degree. So these two bounds are, uh, are trivial lower bounds, but in fact they are sharp. Okay, so I will be more interested by the second largest eigenvalue. And uh, what is known is that when the degree is at least uh, much larger than log n to the fourth, the second largest has a semicircuit, has a random matrix scaling. So the second largest eigenvalue behaves like two square root of d, which, if you recall, was a semi, so the regime of uh, random matrix theory. Okay? And uh, I put in red the Furedian Kamloch paper because uh, essentially all I'm going to talk about are consequence of ideas uh, in this paper. Okay, so when you are, uh, when you are in the regimes we are, which we are not covered by that, uh, we already only knew that uh, as soon as the degree is of order log n, the large, the you have uh, up to a constant factor, the, the random matrix scaling. This is a result by Feige and Ofec. Ofec. And when d is much less than log n, uh, this, it's not true anymore. So the fact that it's not true is quite easy uh, because if you have two rows which have disjoint support, okay, it's, it's, it's essentially trivial to check that the second largest eigenvalue will be at least the minimal L2 norm of each of the rows, of your two rows. Okay, and the, the, the L2 norm of the rows are just the square root of the degree. Okay, so, and when D is much less than log N, 
it corresponds to the case when the maximal degree behave much, is much larger than its expectation, that's the, expect that's the average degree, okay? And this lower bound is sharp, okay? So, uh, so with uh, anti nodes, uh, with the floor, Ben and George and anti nodes, we have proved, uh, we, have an ex we have an equivalent of the case largest eigenvalue by saying that it is roughly the case largest the square root of the degrees. Okay, but so this is when the degree is much less than log n. It's not going to be the regime I'm, I'm mostly interested in in this talk. So let's, I will not comment more on the proof. What I want to speak about in the first part of the talk is this bound, which says that the largest eigenvalue is at most the max of the L2 norm, the, the max of the square root of the degrees, times two plus something which goes to zero as uh, n goes to infinity or as soon as d is large enough, as soon as d goes to zero. A consequence of that is that when the degree is much larger than log n, uh, since it's, it's a very it's a one line by using just Bennett inequality, we check that this is exactly the regime where the degrees concentrate, that the max and the minimal degree co are close to d, to the expectation. Then it, in this regime, as soon as you are in this regime, this inequality implies that the second largest eigenvalue is at least two square root of d. Okay, so it fills the gap between the, the log n to the fourth and the regime of uh, phi g and of phi g. Okay? And, uh, okay, so for example, it means that when you could also look at the, uh, at the spectrum of the simple random walk on, the direct, on a, your Erdos-Rini graph, at, look, at least when d is much larger than log n, you will find that if you, you could divide just by square root d and you will get, uh, by d and you will get uh, an equivalent for the second largest eigenvalue. Okay, so the real theorem we prove is this statement, that if you take a matrix with independent, an Hermitian matrix with independent entries, which are normalized such so that the, the maximal uh, square of the L2 rows, of the maximal square of the L2 norm of uh, a row, the expectation is one, okay, so it's just, a, this was the max of the expectation of the degree in the case of the Erdos-Rini graph. Uh, then you assume that the variance, so they are centered, the variance uh, is like a, at most kappa over n, so this says that the, 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 vari the variance of one and three is of order one over n, okay, because uh, the sum of n terms is of order one. Okay, so this kappa measures the inhomogeneity of the, of the variables h, x, y. And you also assume that they are bounded by some parameter q, and the larger q is, the, the, f the smaller your entries are, and the flattest, so the less sparse you are. And we have a general bound which says the following, that the norm of h is comparable to the L2 norm so L2 to infinity norm, which is just the maximal L2 norm of each row, times two plus C over Q. Okay, so this two is exactly the random matrix scaling, and this is a term which is going to zero as soon as the entries are uh, small enough. Okay, so we are, and there is, there is also a, a lower bound, which is this term is all, always less than the norm of H. Okay. So uh, that's uh, the bound I want to use. So it can be used, for example, for um, do some spectral clustering. Uh, for example, if you take a model where you, you take, instead of looking at my Erdos-Rini graph, you take an inhomogeneous Erdos-Rini graph where all ent entries are equal to one or zero with probability p, x, y. Then the max, the d will be the max expected degree and the bound I've just said is that the norm of A minus its expectation, which is just the matrix with all P, X, Y, is bounded by the max of the square root of the, square root of the degrees times two plus this vanishing factor. Okay? And uh, okay, so you could see that as a, con as a result on the concentration of, uh, uh, in, no in, the, in the sense of the operator norm of the adjacency matrix of random graphs when you write A as being its expectation plus something which is a noise, uh, you will be able to infer information about its expectation at least for eigenvalues of this matrix whose, uh, which are much larger than the norm of the noise. 
Okay, so, but it's not that smart to do spectral clustering with HSNC matrix, so I don't want to stress on that. Okay, so to explain you, uh, so we made uh, an improvement compared to what people knew how to do with, uh, so I have to tell you what was uh, the method of Furedian Comloche. It's a very nice method. And uh, it's very robust, so. So what did, what did they do? Uh, so I just stick to the case of the adjacent matrix of the Erdoshoni graph, okay? Where every entry is a Bernoulli with parameter D over N. So you have no way to, uh, to control the, the operator norm just like that. So what you do is you will compare the operator norm with the trace of a, H of a large power of, um, of your matrix. So you use this inequality. That the norm of H power K is bounded by the trace of H power K. Okay, that's clear because you, this is one of the eigenvalues of this matrix. And K is even, sorry. And then when you do that, you are typically off by a factor N because there are N eigenvalues here and here so you are just count, bounding one eigenvalue by N others. So you will typically, you want to prove that the operator norm of this matrix is two, up to small terms. Okay, which two, remember, it's uh, the random matrix scaling. So you want to find the bound of this form and the n has to be here because uh, when you do that, you, you are off by a factor n. Okay, so, but if the power is much larger than log n, if you take one over k power of this inequality, you would get exactly your answer because n power one over k would be close to one. Okay, so the first, and then uh, what you want to do, just to use Markov inequality, is to look at the expectation of the trace of the high power of h and prove that it has a bound of this form. If you, find, if you prove that, uh, you have uh, proved that the norm of h is of order two, at least two, at most two, sorry. That's the map followed by uh, Fioridian Comloche. And the point is that you have to look at trace where k is at least power which are at least log n, much larger than log n. So then you are just, it's very brutal, you expand the trace as a, uh, the sum of all entries of the products of the, the sum of all gamma one, gamma k. You think of gamma, these gamma i's, uh, you think of them as a path that you follow. And then on your way, you just protect the product of all weights that you visit on your path. And it's a closed path, so it ends where it started. But then you, the variables are, are centered, so this will be zero if there is one edge that is visited only once. Okay, because these variables are independent. Okay, I mean, the, 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 the entries of your matrix H are independent, so if there is one edge but you visit only once, you will, the, the expectation will be zero. So what you can reduce this sum, you can reduce exactly as a sum over closed walks which visit at edge at least twice. Okay, so that's the first point, the crucial point. And then what is the probability? So if there is, I, there is so you take unlabeled closed walks, so your, your walk, visit V vertices, so, so it's then, since it's unlabeled, you have uh, N power V, N times N minus one up to N minus V plus one possibilities for the, for the vertices, okay? So this term comes from the fact that you count unlabeled closed works. The one over square root D power K is just the fact that your matrix, you are, there is a normalization by square root D and you take works of like K, so that's it's there. And then this bound is just, every time that you visit an edge, you have to check whether or not the Bernoulli variable is one or zero. I mean, since we, you remember you are in the other graph case. So this is essentially D over N power the number of vertices. So when you write that, you are essentially, you have not, not, you have not lost anything. Okay, so, so here you have a, a walk, you visit, uh, it's a long walk, it starts at one, it ends at one, it visits uh, seven edges and six, six vertices, okay? So if you reorganize the term, you can put an n outside. You the square of the table with, with square root of d, you can rewrite them like that. And here, so here you see the sum, you have to, so when you see this expression, you count walks, closed walks, which visit each edge twice. And you want to count them by something which is, which counts them in terms of the number of edges of the graph they span and of the genus, so the other characteristics, the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus one of the graph they span, 
Okay, so it's a tough combinatorial problem, but uh, it's essentially what is this expectation of the trace. Okay, so to understand where the two power k comes from, is fact, if you visit exactly each edge twice, <laughs> okay, and if the graph, contrary to here, if the graph, if you visit each edge exactly twice, and if the graph is a tree, the number of elements here is just the Catalan number. Okay, and you know what exactly what the Catalan number, it grows like two power k. Okay, so, so you have to check that if in this expansion, the, the leading terms are trees, are paths and trees which visit each edge twice, or a small deformation of that. But it's, it's very complicated, and the best bound have been proved by Wu, uh, and it works only when t is large enough. So you don't get close to the log n regime. Okay, so the one way to, to, to the point is that Fioridia and Comloche, uh, the method is correct, but the, the matrix they use on the, um, for which they apply their method is not a good one. So I'll try to convince you that it's smarter to look at non-backtracking matrix. Okay, so that's uh, the most important slide. Uh, what is this matrix? So you start with your favorite matrix of size N then the non-backtracking matrix is a matrix of size n squared. Okay, so, so you can think of that as a matrix on the edges, so where an element of n squared is just a pair of uh, integers from one to n. Okay, so you can think of that as a directed edge from x to y. And then in matrix form, the non-backtracking matrix, we put an entry B of EF, which will be non-zero only if you have this configuration. So the end point of E is the starting point of F, and the end point of F is not the starting point of E. So you say that F of is f uh, E uh, is followed by F, but F is not the, the reverse or the inverse of, of E, okay? And then you put a weight, which is the weight HAB, which, which is the weight of F. Okay, so it's a complicated matrix, but uh, simple enough. So it, it's not Hermitian. Uh, so it has no, it has not an, uh, it, it's not even normal, so it has not an orthogonal basis of eigenvectors. But still, uh, it's a very interesting matrix. And it was introduced by Hashimoto uh, for problems related to uh, zeta function on graphs, but it's a completely different story. And there were, there were no, uh, no weights, but. So what we, the, 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 the algebraic, uh, the, the linear algebra trick uh, hidden be behind our result with uh, Florent and Antti, is that uh, you can, this is a completely deterministic statement, which says that you can upper bound the operator norm of a matrix H in terms of two times the L2 to infinity norm of H, which is exactly this two is exactly the two of the random matrix scaling, but it's a deterministic statement, plus something which will, when you will see the diff, when you will see the difference, which will be positive only if you, you have to compare the diff between the compare, the spectral radius of the non-backtracking matrix, so rho is the spectral radius, sorry, minus this uh, L2 to infinity norm squared, plus some remainder term, which will be small when all entries of your matrix are small. So you see it's a completely deterministic bound where you bound an operator norm of an Hermitian matrix by uh, a spectral radius of a non-Hermitian matrix. That's a very shocking inequality, but uh, uh, so that's very powerful. And uh, so the, the uh, we not explain you the proof, but the, the, starting, the, the first lemma is uh, there are a lot of correspondences between spectrum of non-backtracking matrices and spectrum of, um, of uh, matrix, the, the original matrix. One of them is that, uh, so this, this formula goes by the name of ERA and BAS, but probably they should I think it's improper, but they should more be called uh, Sunada and uh, Hashimoto, but whatever. They are called the Arabas formula. So. Uh, so they say that if you just look at the conclusion, an eigen, you lambda is an eigenvalue of the non-backtracking matrix, B, if and only if uh, a zero is in, the mat is in the kernel of, a, so this is a matrix of size N squared, if and only if zero is in the kernel of a matrix of size N, where H lambda and D lambda are like, the D lambda is a diagonal matrix, 
and h lambda is uh, this matrix, and you see that when lambda is large, h lambda is essentially h, and d lambda, you see here, if you remove that part, you almost see the L2 to, you almost see the, the, the square of the, of the Euclidean norm of the rows indexed by x, okay? So by iterating this, uh, this identity in a smart way, uh, we are able to prove this inequality. Okay, so then what we really prove is only uh, a claim on the spectral radius of a non-backtracking matrix. So these are the statistical assumptions, it's always the same. And we prove that the spectral radius is of order, is a one plus something, which vanish. So this is, a, you see here, a notion, uh, something which is very related to the non-normality of B, because the, if you think about the Erdos-Rini case, the, and let's say that Q, uh, it's easy to see that the operator norm of B will go to infinity with N, because the operator norm of B will essentially be the largest uh, degree in the graph, the square root of the largest degree in the, in the graph, which goes to infinity. But still, the spectral radius of this matrix uh, re remains of order one. So you have a matrix which, ha which has a large norm, but a much smaller uh, spectral radius. It's possible because it's a non-normal matrix. And then the consequence of that is that uh, as a corollary of the two theorems, you get exactly the claim. Okay? So everything is would be, so the only last thing I have to do is to tell you why is it easy, it is much easier to prove that than just to prove the good bound, the, pro, the, the, the bound that we are looking for directly on the matrix H. We have made some effort to go into the non-backtracking world, but I have to convince you that it's uh, this statement is much simpler that, uh, uh, that you might think. So what we do is just we apply the method of Fourier and Kolmash to the matrix B. Okay, so again, we just think about the simplest case of the adjacency matrix of the Erdos-Rini. Okay, with average degree D, so this is the scaling obtained to get the, the asymptotics, to get the assumptions uh, correctly. So you bound the spectral radius power k by the norm of the matrix, by the operator norm of the matrix B to the k. Okay, well, you take k even. And then you use the same uh, step as in the uh, Feridian Comlos, you bound the norm by a trace. And since they are n squared, uh, it's a matrix of size n squared, you aim at an inequality like that. Because I remember you, but you want to prove that rho of B is essentially one. You aim at an inequality like that. So the expectation of trace of, this has exactly the same form as what we did previously. So I just recopied, uh, just did the same, but uh, the, the same thing that we did before. So you have to count walks uh, by the genus of the graph they span and the number of edges of the graph they visit. But now you just, you don't count all closed walks. You count unlabeled walks, which are non-backtracking. Means that gamma t plus one is different from gamma t minus one. And there are some fancy uh, boundary conditions like that. So they start at gamma one, and the last two steps are like that, and then you come back here, and the last two steps are like that. So it's exactly the, for, the same thing as uh, the Fioridian Comloche, but now we count on a much smaller set. But meaning that vi, you know, on, on this part and on this part, you are not backtracking. So I have to convince you that the, the, the underlying combinatorial, so it's a purely combinatorial problem, but this is much easier. So this is explained uh, in, with this slide. Okay, so you take a, a, a walk, a non-backtracking walk, which, which visits E edges and V vertices, and the genus is, uh, the Euler character is E minus V plus one, okay? So v, this is my, the, my walk, okay? I don't know how do you get there, but. Uh, Imagine that this is a graph of the span by the walk. So now what you do is you, every time that you see a vertex of degree two, you just remove it. Okay, so this long pass is replaced by that. Uh, this pass is replaced by that and so on. Okay, so you see this transform, okay? So now you could look at the, tr you have your walk on which lives here and you look at the trace of this work on this reduced graph. But since you have only reduced uh, degree two vertices, 
if I give you the work here, you can deduce back the work there. Because once you start here, since everything is degree two, on when you are on a line, there is only one way to follow a non-backtracking path, it's just to go straight, right? So it is clear that uh, the work here is char uh, characterized the work there, because that's the way we built it, but it's also true in backward. Okay, so but now this reduced work, this, this, the, this work on the reduced graph by just doing some uh, very, very uh, down-to-earth uh, graph, uh, uh, graph topology, you see that the number of edges, the number of vertices, and the maximal degree here are just bounded by the, gen by the genus of the graph. Okay, but you remember that we have to count works counted by G, the genus, and uh, the number of edges. So then, so it becomes very easy just to count works here. You count for a given uh, genus G, you count the maximal number of graphs you could have, so, and then the maximal number of non-backtracking works on this graph, and you pull that back and you get uh, the sharp bound. Okay, we were not the first to think about that. Uh, the first uh, paper on this topic, not on this model, but was Friedman, and uh, this is uh, his contribution. Joe Friedman is uh, the second, is the core of the second part of my talk. Okay, so you see that uh, at least in the random matrix regime, it's very, uh, it's a very natural and powerful idea to use non-backtracking works. So it's a simple uh, algebraic trick just to 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 move from uh, the original matrix to non-backtracking. But then when you in the non-backtracking world, at least all combinatorial, uh, the combinatorial parts are much easier. Okay, so now I want to, so this was the results which were sharp uh, when the degree was uh, large. Okay, if all bounds they were going, they, were, they, were, they had a bound which was like one over the degree, or square root of the degree. Okay, now I want results which are sharp when D is three. Okay, so uh, there is a famous result uh, on this, uh, in this regime. So it's, it's concerned regular graphs. So you take uh, an adjacent symmetry of a d regular graph. So the eigenvalues, the largest eigenvalue, the pure eigenvalue is d, and all the other ones are smaller. And uh, so this is a three regular graph. Uh, it's a Peterson graph. And there is a, a universal lower bound on the second largest eigenvalue. So it's a lower bound on the second largest eigenvalue, so it's an upper bound on the spectral gap. So it says that the second eigenvalue is at, at least two square root of d minus one plus something, minus something which vanish. So it's called Alan Bopana lower bound. And uh, a graph is Ramanujan, uh, non-bipartite, if this, upper, if this lower bound is, uh, is also an upper bound. So if the second large, if all non-trivial eigenvalues are bounded by two square root of d minus one. Okay, so uh, Joe Friedman uh, proved uh, w what was named as uh, Allen's conjecture. Uh, but if you take a d uh, uniformly sample d regular graph on n vertices, then uh, d is at least three, then the s uh, you are almost Ramanujan, meaning that the eigenvalues cannot be, can, cannot be much larger than two square root of d minus one. Okay, so, uh, so it took uh, 22 years to, to have a, a published proof of, of this conjecture. One of the reasons is that um, uh, the method of Fourier and Comloge does not work. There is a simple obstruction. So, because if you apply uh, the method of Fourier and Comloge, you would would like to prove that uh, you take k even, so d power k will be the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, but you are interested by the second largest one. Okay, so this is exactly that. You would like to prove a bound like that, that this, is, this expectation is at least, at most, n power two square root of d minus one plus epsilon power k, and k has to be much larger than log n to kill this factor here. But it's not correct because uh, uh, your graph may contain, your random regular graph may contain uh, a clique of size d, uh, d plus one uh, as a subgraph with probability uh, polynomially small. On this event, your graph will be, will have two connected components, okay? But when your graph has two connected components, uh, the multiplicity of uh, the eigenvalue d is two, at least two. 
So on this, on this event, the trace is at least n power minus c, which is a probability that the, my graph is disconnected, times d power k. But since I'm interested in a regime where k is much larger than log n, this d power k kills any polynomial factor. So this is much larger than that. So, and is a, you have the same thing for the non-backtracking uh, matrix. Uh, you could do the same, uh, the same obstruction creates the same problem. So you have to, um, the first moment method cannot work, so you have to do first some massage and, uh, okay. That's what took uh, long years to Friedman because, so I proposed a new strategy to prove this theorem. So the first step is, was already the step uh, in the original proof of Friedman, is to use the non backtracking matrix instead of the adjacency matrix. But this step already in uh, 91, uh, Friedman uh, knew it because he already wrote a paper on uh, uh, non backtracking works in the regular graphs. But still, due to this obstruction that the first moment method will not work, you still have to, uh, it's still not easy what you should do. So then you deal with the problem that you have these subgraphs which have polynomially small probabilities of occurring but which create big, per big perturbation in the, in the spectrum. So the, the only thing that we do is to remove, you by a, we will just count non-backtracking paths which visit at most one cycle and non-backtracking paths of length uh, c times log n where c is a small constant. Okay. And then the last step is to project, so you are not interested by the largest eigenvalue, by the second largest eigenvalue, so you have to project on the, on the orthogonal of the Perron eigenvector, and uh, there is a nice way to do it, which was found by Laurent Massoulier in a, another paper related to similar topic, where you can bound the else power of, this of the second largest eigenvalue of this matrix in terms of, of operator number of matrices where this is, has to be thought as a remainder term, which is small, and this has to be thought as a matrix where all entries are centered. Okay, I don't write the formal definition because it's impossible to, to write, I mean, it's, it's not very good for slides. And then for this matrix, you use uh, first the method of Fury and Comloche. But now you have some extra difficulties because the matrices are, in the, no, the entries are not independent, but you can still manage to do that. So what Friedman proved is that is a non-backtracking version of the Allen conjecture is that the, the largest eigenvalue is, like, is d minus one for the non-backtracking work, for the non-backtracking matrix. And there is a, this Iarabas formula gives you a, a formula by relating the spectrum of B in terms of the spectrum of A and the, there is a simple quadratic equation which says that mu will be in the spectrum of B if it solves this quadratic equation with la where lambda is an eigenvalue of A. So what really Friedman proves is that the second largest eigenvalue of the non-backtracking matrix is bounded by that. Uh, so this statement, as an ex uh, so the fact that the second largest eigenvalue is square root of the largest one as a form, as an exact uh, converse, as an exact analog in the, for Erdos-Rini matrices. So this is a simulation where an Erdos-Rini graph where average degree four you see that there is one eigenvalue which is, seems to be close to four, and all the other ones that seems to be of moduli less than square root four, which is two. So with Laurent Massouli and Marc Large, we have a theorem about this picture. But we follow this strategy, it's more involved, but we follow the same strategy. And it extends to some uh, a model of uh, where there are some non-homogeneity. It was motivated by some problem and, uh, on uh, spectral clustering, but I don't want to speak about that. Okay, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Yes. Okay, so uh, now I want to tell you about uh, the next generation result on this topic. So we go slowly. Uh, so it's random lifts. So the first time that you should see that, it's a ter horrible uh, slide. So let's look at back. So the model is the following. So you have uh, an adjacent, you have uh, it's a ma matrix of size k times n, okay, where a is, a, so it's a tensor product, a is a tensor product but with something which, a, which with the, with the a i, they are of size k, and the, the second part, the s i and the identity, they are in m n of c, okay, and the s i, they are independent uh, uniform permutation matrices, okay, so you take the permutation matrix associated to uh, 
uh, a uniform permutation on SN. Okay, so it, builds, it gives you a matrix of size k times n. To connect with uh, the, the, the result of uh, Joe Friedman, if, if the a naught is zero and all i are equal to one, so, and to make it uh, reversible, to make it Hermitian, you, when you have si, you also put its inverse, which is it's a joint, of course. Okay, so what you can interpret that, when the, when the all ai are equal to one and uh, the dimension k is one, it's the Hessian symmetry of a random 2D regular graph, where you have, uh, for each permutation, if you have x, you have sigma y of x, which are outgoing edges, and you have ingoing sigma i minus 1. Okay. So it gives you, here you have two, here you have d, and here d, so it's a 2D regular graph. Okay, so when you take uh, weights which are not zero, it's an interesting model, it's an anisotropic random walk. You are interested by a random walk, so you put a weight here, ai, Let's, so uh, let's say that the AI are, uh, okay, are non-negative. So you are, looking, you are looking at a random work on a random graph where you take the ice, um, you take the, the, the ice permutation with a probability which depends on the permutation. So it's called an anisotropic random work. Uh, okay. So that's the model. So for general K, the way you have to think about that is a random lift. So what is that? Imagine to, that the AI, uh, they are just, all, all of them are of the form E, X, I, Y, I. So where E, X, Y is just a matrix right, which has a zero, all entries at zero, except uh, the, X, the entry X, Y. Okay, I think it's a usual notation. Then, uh, if you do that, A1, which is, uh, well, you, uh, which is this, is simply the adjacent symmetry of a graph where you have k vertices and d edges, where you put an edge between the xi and the yi. Okay? You follow me? Okay. So now, the model we're interested in is by, so forget about that. We are now, what we have our matrix A1, which is just the same thing but without the tensor product. And what we are doing, we are doing a lift of this graph. So, so this is A1. For each edge, we take, we, we have a random permutation. So you have D random permutation. And what we do here in the, this matrix, uh, sorry, uh, this matrix A becomes the adjacency matrix of this graph. Okay, well, what you do is that uh, you will, over each verti vertex of A1, you have, you, you take a fiber of length of, of size n, so here n is equal to three, so you create three copies of each vertex of the base graph, and then you, you match them according to the permutation matrices that you have sampled on the edges. Okay, so this, this construction is called a random lift, a random m lift in, uh, in graph theory. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, construction. Okay, which allows you to, in some sense, increase, you have a fixed graph and you look at, uh, as, as, at an enlarged graph on a, which has much more vertices but which keeps the same local structure. Around each vertex you have exactly, for example here, around each vertex here you have one red, one green, and one blue vertices, uh, edges. Okay, so it's called a random lift. So the, the, the vector space, so here, the vec since one is an eigenvalue of, of all the SI. It's a permutation matrix, so it's a stochastic matrix. So you deduce that the vector space uh, CK tends uh, the constant vector is an invariant, is an, is invariant under, for A, and so and the eigenvalue and A restricted to this vector space is just A1. Okay, so it implies that all eigenvalues of A are eigenvalues of A1. So for the lift, it implies that any eigenvalue here will be an eigenvalue of this graph, whatever the choice of the permutation. So, but now what we are interested in are, these are so, so called uh, trivial eigenvalues. We are interested by the new eigenvalues, the non-trivial one, and the largest non-trivial one, so which is the largest eigenvalue uh, on the orthogonal of this invariant subspace. Okay, so largest uh, meaning the right edge of the spectrum. Okay, so 
So here is an anisotropic random walk. So d is equal to three. Uh, I've made a simulation, and so he, so one is a pair eigenvalue. value. So it's an eigen. It's, this is an odd eigenvalue. value. It's a trivial eigenvalue. value. But all the other one are not trivial, and uh, there seems to be to to stick to a bulk. Okay. So you can describe uh, the operator. So what I want to tell you is the limit of that. So it's fairly easy to understand what it is. So there is a limit operator, which is an operator on, uh, on uh, a tree, okay, which is a free group, where you take d copies of z. Okay? You define the operator, which is exactly the same mm -hmm. as the operator A, except that you have replaced your, uh, so the identity is still the identity, but you replace the permutation matrices by multiplication uh, by the generators of uh, the copies of z. Okay? So this so you, this is left multiplication by an element, uh, by, uh, by, the, by the ice generator. So this is a unitary matrix. This is a unitary operation on uh, L2 of x, where x is my uh, infinite tree. Okay, so this operator describes, lo de is in some sense, uh, a lim limit as n goes to infinity of my matrix of size n. Why? Because when you look at a graph with my random permutation, you see very few cycles. Because the probability that you see a cycle after 10 steps, every time that you want to know that if the probability that sigma i of x is x is for the 1 over n, but if you do two steps, it will be still for the 1 over n. Okay, so you, the local limit around each point here, if you would expand here, you would get exactly uh, this picture. So the, 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 the right head of the support uh, of this oper of this operation operator, it, it has uh, been computed, at least in the scalar case, when k is equal to 1, it's a famous formula due to Ackerman and Ostrand. And there is a book, uh, which I did not write the reference, by Fika Telamanka and Spiegel on this anisotropic random walks on uh, trees. Okay. So there are formulas for... Uh, so our theorem with Benoit Collins is that uh, the largest non-trivial eigenvalue of the random matrix, where you take independent permutation matrices, converge to the right edge of the spectrum of the limit operator. So this generalizes to weights and to higher dimensions the theorem of Friedman. Uh, Benoit Collins is more interested by uh, 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 functional analysis and uh, quantum probability. So. His motivation was that one, is uh, to prove that the strong asymptotic freeness of, uh, of permutation, so for, for uh, it imp so this statement by a standard trick implies that if you take any polynomial in terms of the permutation matrices, okay, so we don't know, you take, uh, you take S1 squared plus S2, S1 star, power four, right, for example, and here you put a, not an A1. So for example, this polynomial. The op so this polynomial, so since this is a permutation matrices, matrix, one is an eigenvector. One is, the constant vector is an eigenvector. Okay, so we are all, there is a trivial event space, which is a constant vector. So you look in the orthogonal of this trivial eigen space. And then the operator norm is restricted to this uh, orthogonal of the trivial eigen space, converge to the operator norm of the same thing, on the same polynomial on the free group. Okay. Uh, so, uh, very quickly, so what we do is just we have a non back cracking version of, uh, we prove, uh, we, you can define this setting, forget about this notation, you can define this setting a non back cracking operator exactly as I did, except that now it will be a, a, a non back cracking operator which is uh, matrix valued, so because we are in a, uh, we took a, a, a tensor product. And what we prove is that for all choice of the weights, the spectral, uh, so there is the spectral radius of the non backtracking eigenvector in the orthogonal of a trivial space, uh, in, of a trivial invariant subspace, is controlled by uh, the same, by the spectral radius of the same operator on the, defined on the infinite uh, tree. Okay? So this is a, simulation of this theorem. So this would correspond to, this is the eigenvalues of a non-backtracking matrix of an anisotropic random walk. There is a Perron eigenvalue, which is a, a trivial one, 
and all the other ones they tend to to be to they are they are in a ball they are in a disk of a radius exactly the spectral radius of the limit operator on the infinite tree on the free group. Okay, so we follow exactly the same strategy that I've explained you for the Friedman theorem. The, the only point is that we now since we have weights, it's more complicated and uh, there are non-commutative weights because it's, we deal with matrices, so it's more complicated. So we have a refinement of ER Rabas type formulas, which uh, were analog to some work of, recent work of Nalini and Anandaraman. Okay, so I don't want to, much, to stress much on that, just to conclude. And okay, so I've presented for you what, what, what was the state statement when you took, when you take it, when you were taking, uh, independent permutation, uh, permutation, but you can also take independent uniform matching, where well, matching is a permutation without a fixed point. It's an involution without a fixed point. Okay, so some conclusion. So I hope to have convinced you that uh, non backtracking operators are uh, very good to study the, the edge of the spectrum uh, on, for graphs or structures which are locally tree-like. So for in the first part, we have seen that we, were, we wanted to do a, a, a perturbation around the Catalan number, which we are counting walks on trees. And uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why it was very important, a very nice idea to look at non-backtracking matrices. And on the other one, uh, it was a more obvious. The model locally looks like a tree. Okay, so it can also be used to study eigenvalues inside the, the spectrum. So in this picture, uh, here, uh, Alan Taraman and Sabri, they use a non backtracking operator to deduce properties of eigenvectors associated to an eigenvalue in the bulk. So eigenvalues here, not at the edge. Okay, but it's a completely different story, but still. And uh, there are, let's say, four op nice open problems. Uh, problems. So we have, it could be used probably to study uh, more complicated ensembles like, uh, for example, the, the mark, if you take a configuration, the, the, the transition matrix of, uh, the, sim of the simple random walk on, a, on, for example, the configuration model, which is a random graph with given degree sequence. Uh, there is a small gap in Erdos-Rini graph in the regime when D is exactly of order log N, we have a lower bound and upper bound which, are, which match up to a factor two. But I have a conjecture about what is exactly the asymptotic equivalent of lambda two, uh, okay, which is between these uh, two factors. So uh, historically, this high trace, this large trace expansion, they were uh, uh, people hoped that they could be uh, of use to deduce properties of the, to, to, find, to be fine enough to to, to prove the fluctuation of the largest eigenvalue, I have only proved a stated result which are first order results. There is always a possibility if you are able to take very traces of power which are much larger, you can also detect the fluctuation. This was done by Soshnikov in random matrix theory. And uh, maybe it's also possible to do it uh, in similar models, but it's, it's much more technical and much more difficult. And uh, I mentioned an Alon Bopana bound, which was a lower bound on the spectral radius for uh, adjacency matrix or the uh, random walks. Of the, but there is no Alon Bopana bound, lower bound for non backtracking matrices. And the reason is that, is that they, do, they are not uh, normal matrices, or they don't have a orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. But still, I believe that there is an Alon Bopana lower bound, but uh, I have no proof. So that's some perspective, so thank you. So any uh, questions, please?